I think we got started. We got an official notice that um, the recording has started. So I want to welcome everyone to our UD beginning, um, an opportunity to learn about the University of Dayton and its history alongside um, a fabulous wine tasting uh, focusing on rosé tonight. Um, so this is, in my opinion, the best way to learn history with um, a few glasses of delicious wine and learning about the wine too. So all kinds of learning all the way around and all kinds of fun tonight. Um, I wanna start by introducing myself and our other panelists. Um, my name is Allison Lee. I work in the office for Mission and Rector and my role is Director of Marianist Strategies. So I focus on doing all kinds of programming around Marianist mission and identity like this great program tonight. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here. I love all creative approaches to um, engaging with our Marianist history and traditions. Uh, so we'll be learning more about that and I'll say more about that in a minute. But before we go into it, I want to introduce our other panelists, um, Bill Whiting, and I will let him say more about his background, his extensive background in wine and um, his connections with UD. Ah, you did it right there. Thanks, Allison. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. How are you? Um, yeah, so uh, I've been in the wine industry for over 25 years. And uh, of course, a UD graduate class of 1990. So, uh, but this is exciting. We did this back in December and it was a lot of fun and um, we wanted to do it again. Actually, the uh, Mackenzie came up with the idea for doing rosé on this. So I really want to thank Mackenzie, but also want to thank you, Allison, for leading this as well. So looking forward to tasting with y'all here shortly. Yes. Um, all right. Thanks, Bill. I should also mention I have two uh, graduate degrees from UD as well. So um, a, a, a proud alumna as well. Um, so I want to give a couple of logistics things tonight. We are going to be utilizing the Q&A. So if you have a question at any point throughout the session, feel free to submit that. Um, and at the end, there will be a Q&A time. So we will do our best to answer all those questions at that time. They can be about the wine or about the history um, or some combination of both. Um, so feel free to use those. Um, if you're curious about that last session, um, Marianist and Bordeaux, that was about the history of our Marianist founders and um, tied in with Bordeaux wines, um, that uh, recording is available. Um, so at, as this one will be after the event. So um, just know that that's out there. And if there are more that you want like this, um, we'll be happy to keep doing them. So um, that is, I think, all of the logistics for this evening. Um, I want to, I think, Bill, if you want to talk about anything before we get into the history part, the first um, history section, any tips you have for the wine tasting or things that people should have ready? Um, well, actually, the nice thing is you don't have to worry about getting a wine opener because two of the wines we're having are twist top and the other is a sparkling wine top. So no, just hopefully you have all the wines chilled. Um, that would be nice. Uh, if not, it's OK. You can still taste the wines at uh, somewhat of a room temperature. Uh, but they also taste a little bit nicer when they're chilled. So that's pretty much it. Pretty easy. Okay, perfect. Great. Um, then with that, we will. Um, so the way this is going to work is we're going to do a little bit of history, a little bit of wine, a little bit of history, a little bit of wine. We'll keep going like that um, until, until the Q&A time at the end. Um, so I'm going to get started with the first section of um, our story, our UD beginning. How did UD become a university? Um, and we are one of the older universities in the country. So um, I love the story of our roots, and I'm going to just um, share my screen uh, quickly here to start talking about um, a little bit more about that, really. Uh, so here we go. Um, so um, from Farm to Flyers, our UD beginning. So here we go. How did UD become a school? And it begins with what I call the story of Nazareth. Um, because it was Nazareth Farm at the very beginning. And I'm going to share a little bit more about how all of this came to be, the relationships that were built, and how the Marianists came to UD. Um, but what I, I'm going to start with a one minute, one and a half minute video. Um, so I'm going to do that really quick. I think I might need to stop um, the share here and share again. Um, but the video is from a place on UD's campus. I actually have a um, Marianist tour of, of UD. Uh, different um, significant uh, Marianist uh, website or websites, um, sites and locations, statues, um, just significant um, places that are tell a little bit about our Marianist heritage. And this is one of the videos from the cemetery, but it also talks about our UD beginning. So I am going to share this right now. Um, and like I said, it's just one minute and then I'll get into more of the story about it as we go on.
1850, four Marianists arrived in Dayton to assist with the cholera epidemic. They were a teacher, a cook, a gardener, and a priest. Led by Father Leo Meyer, the first president of UD, they purchased the property that would become UD from the Stewart family. When they did, they promised two things, to repay the loan of $12,000 and that the brothers would always watch over Mary Louisa. Mary Louisa was the infant daughter of the Stewarts who died in the Dayton cholera epidemic. It was her death which motivated the Stewart family to return to Europe. Little Mary Louisa was buried in a cemetery which is now the fairgrounds neighborhood. The brothers moved her body to campus and this site. She is the only female to be buried at UD. The Marianists buried here dedicated their lives to the mission of Father Chaminade. In the 1960s, the Marianists stopped using this as a burial place and created a cemetery at another local Marianist property, Mount St. John. All right. All right, so I'm going to just um, share the slideshow once again. Um, Hopefully uh, that gives you a little insight to a place you may have walked by on campus and not known um, as much about. I kind of love that about doing Marianist tours of UD is that there's so many little great nooks and crannies and places um, to visit that really tell a lot about our story. And I love the fact that Mary Louisa is buried on our campus and is the only female buried there. And really if it weren't for her very short life, we wouldn't have UD as we know it today. So let me start with first, there was the four Marianists that were mentioned, the priest, the gardener, the teacher, and the cook that came to UD um, or came to, came to Dayton back in around 1849. Um, UD was founded in 1850. Um, the, those four came from the Alsace region in um, Germany, like which is right on the border of France. Um, the Marianists were expounding and wanted to establish a community in the, United, in the United States. So they first came to Cincinnati. And then Father Leo Meyer, who was pictured here, was called upon to help with the cholera outbreak in Dayton. So uh, another kind of big disease epidemic, um, not quite a pandemic, but an epidemic. So he, he came up to Dayton to help with the church and the parish that was nearby. And he became acquainted with John Stewart. And um, John Stewart and his family wanted to move back um, to Europe after, after their daughter died. And so he agreed to sell them the property, which Leo Meyer saw as he had this vision that it could be a school um, and that this would be a great place for the Marianists to establish themselves in Ohio. Um, so it was in the midst of this epidemic um, and because of Mary Louise's death that the opportunity became available. Um, Leo Meyer had the vision for it and the property was going to cost $12,000, which um, I know now would be a great steal for any property that we would wanna buy. Um, so. He wanted to buy it, but he had no money. Um, <laughs> so what do you do in that situation? He promised uh, John Stewart that he would pay back the loan at a 6% interest rate. Um, and he said, I I'll give you the St. Joseph's Medal as collateral. Um, John Stewart was a man of faith himself. And so he accepted that, um, sold the property to the Marianists. Um, and that is what became the basis of the University of Dayton as we know it today. It's still the same property. Um, so all these years later, 170 years later, it's, it's still the same property and the same land. We've obviously expanded it quite a lot. Um, but that's how we began with these four brothers that came um, over here to Ohio uh, to establish um, the Marianists in the United States. And they had this vision for a school in Dayton. And, and this is the opportunity that came about. Um, the other thing I want to mention that I always think is interesting is it took them 24 hours to get from Cincinnati to Dayton um, via horse and carriage. And I always thought that was like, it didn't really register as all that amazing until someone told me you could actually run that faster than the horse and carriage took them. So if you think about that, it's about 50 miles. Um, you could run or walk that in less time. Um, so to think about how they had to get here and it was this long journey and nowadays, um, obviously we have 75, so it would be a lot quicker. Um, but if you had to, you could walk it in, in fewer hours. Um, I also wanted to share about our early years. One of the, the four um, was Max Zaylor. And you might know Zaylor Hall, which is pictured, um, which is pictured below in the picture in color. Um, and it's actually, it's one of those buildings, it's connected to St. Joe's. So a lot of people don't know that that's Zaylor Hall. Um, he was one of the, he was the third president of the university, um, I believe. And 
I feel like he doesn't get enough credit or have enough buildings or things named after him for what he did. Um, he actually had a great vision for UD um, and he added what was Zaylor Hall to, it's St. Joe's where the building, the original building was, um, that was part of the property that they had. The original Stewart Mansion uh, burned down. Um, UD has a history of being plagued by fire. So the, the initial building that they had burned in 1855, I think. Um, so they had to rebuild and they built a building that, that was kind of basically the same uh, at the same footprint as St. Joe's, um, but that building later burned down. Um, so now we have St. Joe's. Um, so all in that place, he, they built a building for uh, classrooms and for borders of the school. Um, so that was necessary. And then he added the normal school, which was Zaylor Hall, um, and then added Liberty Hall. This was all, the campus was growing. Um, so it started with 14 boys um, and, and continued to grow. So he added Liberty Hall, the Immaculate Conception Chapel, which was built in 1869. And then in, in 1870, he built St. Mary's. And St. Mary's is a fun story because at the time it was built, it was the biggest building in the city of Dayton. Um, and it sits high on a hill. Um, and if you can imagine Dayton, the landscape before there were any big buildings. So think of St. Mary's as the biggest high on this hill. Um, it was called Zaylor's Folly because they thought, why would any place ever need a building as big as St. Mary's is? Um, and I love thinking about that because obviously we have many more buildings that are bigger than St. Mary's now. Um, because the University of Dayton has continued to grow. And St. Mary's has served um, in basically every function it could have served throughout the years. It's now an administration building, but at one time it was labs. Um, it's been classrooms. It's been a place for people to stay. So it's served a number of purposes through the years. And one of the important points about Zaylor's vision for all of these buildings, uh, most of which really exist in, in some um, semblance of their original form, um, is that they were simple and practical. So we needed a big building and Zaylor had the vision to see that, um, but he also knew it, we aren't building fancy ornate architecture here. We're building things that can really work and function for multiple years. Um, so if you're wondering about the Marianists, they're quite prudent um, and thoughtful about how um, they go about taking on things like building projects. Um, or any other big vision they might have for the university. Like there is, there's an element of simplicity and there's an element of practicality to that. I think we can still see that today. Um, so they're not afraid of doing big things that are scary. Um, Zaylor's folly, people mocked him for that, but here, here we are and we are still using that building today. And I, the other thing I wanna mention is if you're ever back on campus and have an opportunity to walk in that building, we still have the original steps that say um, St. Mary's College in there. So um, if you have a chance, uh, every I, my office is in that building, and when we're not working remotely, every day I walk up those stairs and think about what um, Brother Zaylor did for UD and how grateful I am for his vision and leadership. All right, I'm actually going to stop there for right now, and I'm going to turn it over to Bill to talk about our first wine tasting, and then I will go into um, a second significant chapter in our history. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Allison. How are you? Um, well, I have a few slides I wanted to um, share with you. This is um, this is an interesting topic when you talk about rosés because people think rosés are a seasonal wine or something that you only have it in the in the spring. But um, it's it's really quite interesting how far rosé has come. Um, and you know that you know there is a wide spectrum of colors and styles to rosés. You have light color rosés, you have dark color rosés, um, and they could be from many different grape varieties from different regions. So and pretty much every wine growing region produces a rosé. Uh, and again, the colors you might have noticed the colors from the three bottles that you have. There is one that's light, there's one that's non, one there's medium. Uh, and the thing about rosés, which is nice, is also um, every grape can produce a rosé, especially red, and you can blend some whites in as well. So the nice thing about rosés, they are incredible food wines. They are very versatile. They do not overpower the food whatsoever. So sometimes you might have a red wine or even a white wine, and it will overpower what you're having with your meal. Rosés are not that way at all. They are just so soft and beautiful and energetic and energizing. And they do, they work well, uh, you know, rosés work well from anywhere from wine bars to local barbecue joints to what we're doing right now. It is uh, again, such universal appeal. Um, and it is, like I said before, expanding beyond its seasonality because it has become a mainstay. 
And what I mean by mainstay is uh, you'll see not uh, in two slides from now, I'll show you how important rosés are around the world. So global rosé consumption, believe it or not, France is the number one consumer of rosé. If you believe it or not, rosé actually outsells white wine in France, which uh, when I heard that statistic, I just couldn't believe it. I actually had to double check it, but it is true. The French really love their rosé. And believe it or not, the USA is the number two market in the world for consumption of rosés. So we'll go to the next slide. And uh, as I mentioned before, projections are showing the rosé trend continuing. And we think that um, it's going to represent a huge increase in the next coming years. Uh, right now, it represents about 15% of the total U.S. market. Now, again, these were taken from 2019 numbers. They didn't include 2020, of course, because of the craziness that went on. Uh, but what is driving rosé? Why is it popular? Well, of course, the rise of younger, more adventurous wine consumers. Uh, and the thing about them, what I've learned is they'll try anything and rosés do appeal because again, you have different colors, you have different levels of sweetness. So today we're gonna to be tasting three rosés. They're gonna be going from 1.4 grams per liter of residual sugar all the way up to 14.4. There's many different grape varieties. Again, they come from different countries. So it is, uh, it's, it's beautiful. Um, and it also has an attractive price point. When was the last time you went out and you spent over $60 for a bottle of rosé? You haven't and you won't. That's the beauty of it. Uh, and again, it has a very accessible flavor profile. It goes with just about everything, but it even is better by itself. The next slide will actually show you, uh, this is a, a map of the world of rosé consumption. And uh, as you can see right there, France is number one, United States is number two, and Great Britain is number three, followed by Italy, Germany, Spain, the Netherlands, China, Russia, and Belgium. And like I said, it is growing rapidly. Uh, the next slide will actually show you where in the United States. So New York is number one. Yay. Uh, the Washington DC area is number two, California number three, uh, Connecticut, four, five, and but the major cities are Miami, Washington, New York, and, and Los Angeles. So uh, the next slide uh, just shows you the breakouts of the uh, Washington, Oregon, Chile, and France. These are the three top areas for the fastest growing regions of rosé production, and we're going to be having a Chilean, and we're going to be having an Oregonian uh, Pinot Noir as well. We didn't do France because we did French wines on the last webinar, so I wanted to give Chile, Italy, and Oregon a fair shake. So uh, the next slide, please. So the first wine that we're going to be having will be the, um, the Rainstorm, and this is their Pinot Noir Rosé. Now this comes from an area called the Willamette Valley in Oregon. As you can see on the slide there, it says Willamette Valley, but it's actually specifically coming from an area called the Van Duzer Corridor, which you'll see circled uh, on the left there. And so this is a single vineyard as well. Um, some people, when they say there's difficulty when you see, is it Willamette? Is it Willamette? What is it? So, well, we always like to say in the wine world, it's Willamette, damn it. So that's an easy way to remember Willamette, okay? So, all right, so we're gonna try our first wine and this is the Rainstorm Pinot Noir Rosé. This is the 2018 vintage. Um, and what I know you're probably thinking to yourself like, we're in 2021, why are we drinking a rosé that's a few years old? What I wanted to do is I wanted to show you that when a rosé is made very, very well, it can last for a few years. Normally we like to drink rosés when they're young because they're aromatic, they're vibrant, they're fresh. But this is, I wanted to show you how well uh, a good rosé will, will, will last. So this is um, Rainstorm is the producer and they're from the Willamette Valley. Uh, this is a single vineyard. It was planted in 1992. Again, it's 100% Pinot Noir because Pinot Noir is the predominant grape variety in Oregon. Also Chardonnay is as well. Uh, again, these are all hand harvested, so there's no machines. So there's a lot of love and attention. 65% uh, of the grapes were direct press, which gives the acidity and also the elegance and then aged on the lees. Uh, for three months, and that's where the color comes from. So we're gonna give this a, a try here. So again, this is 2018. And the nose, what you're gonna get, wow, you're getting some really nice strawberries. Uh, you're getting a little bit of rose petals and some pomegranate, and that's kind of a typical characteristic for a Pinot Noir Rosé. Oh, wow, well, that's, that's, I'm actually really impressed. I. I didn't try it earlier. I wanted to try it now um, for the freshness, 
but this is pretty in, in, incredible for, for a rosé that's three years going on four years. Um, in the mouth, you're getting some nice currants, some raspberry strawberries, again, that carry over, uh, and a little bit of sweet herbs on that as well. And something like this, you want to be able to pair it. Yeah, again, this can go well with just about everything from, from seafood to vegetables to chicken wings to a spicy chicken sandwich from Wendy's at 2 a.m. in the morning uh, or Milano's or even salad. So, but uh, yeah, this is stunning. Uh, I'm really impressed with this. And I haven't had this in a while too. So I hope you enjoy it as well. So cheers, salute. Allison, back to you. All right. This is... Like I said, the best way to learn history. Um, all right, so I um, want to take on uh, another uh, segment of our UD story. And this is one I think is also, um, I think it's pretty important and also pretty interesting. Um, there, at one point I was working with my boss um, to kind of come up with what were some significant events we thought it, you know, were important to UD's history. and. Um, one of the, uh, so I picked a couple of them for tonight. So obviously we have to talk about the early years and the founding of it. Um, but then we also have to talk about the 1913 flood and why this is important. So I'm taking events from the first um, 70 years of our history, uh, really, uh, tonight to talk with you about, because I think they have significant impact for today and for how the university continues to function. Um, and I think we can see those, um, those strings throughout um, our history. So I want to share a little bit about this um, really difficult time for the city of Dayton and UD's role in it. And I want to start with this image of what the flood looked like. It was a really, really devastating natural disaster. Um, and you can see how, how high the water was and how much the houses were covered. Um, so to get a, kind of the scope of this, there were between 98 and 123 deaths of people. And, and to think that that came from a flood that um, at first, that number might not seem as high when we think we're, I mean, we've been through a COVID pandemic and um, the numbers are upwards of half a million. Um, but when we think about this was a flood um, and, and something that, you know, it, it came up suddenly, but um, also it's water. So you think you might be able to get out of that. Um, it's, it's a significant number of deaths. 65,000 people displaced from their homes, um, which is also, again, a big number of people. And then this is, I, I think, where things start to be a little bit more staggering. Um, two billion dollars in today's economy and property damage um, all around the city of Dayton. Um, and then this is where I think we get a better picture of the time. 133,600 wagon loads of debris were removed. Um, this always breaks my heart a little bit. 13,991 houses and cellars cleaned and disinfected. The, the dead horses is the part that I have a hard time with. The 1,420 dead horses and 2,000 other dead animals. Um, so this is, I mean, this is people's livelihood. It's, it's how they get around. Um, it, it was important that it was really impactful to the economy, right? Um, and Governor Cox declared a state of emergency and Dayton was placed under martial law. So this was a serious and terrible time um, in the city of Dayton and impacted the way they built in different levee systems around the river so that the, those floods wouldn't happen again. Um, so it had a huge impact on the city, but it also had a huge impact on the University of Dayton. In part, because at that time it was still St. Mary's College. So um, it, it changed names in 1920, which I'll get into in the next section, but it was still St. Mary's College at that point. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, St. Mary's Hall was built high on a hill, right? Um, and so is University of Dayton. And if you've ever um, been a student here and walked up uh, Stewart Hill, you know there are plenty of hills um, on our campus. So um, you, you know that. <laughs> There's a lot of hills around UD. You probably walked up them at some point or another. Um, so UD was actually um, relatively protected. Um, so because of that, um, they felt it was important to provide some help to the community. And I am just going to let me just move something really quick. Um, the chat box popped up. Um, and I wanted to, oops, sorry about that. Um, so some things that UD did. It provided shelter and food to nearly 800 people. Um, it had its own spring water supply, infirmary, electric light, heating plant, and laundry. So I, I love thinking about this. A college is kind of a compact, like, micro community, right? Like, there's all of these resources that we have just for the students at the college, um, and they ended up being essential for the city of Dayton and for its people. Um, so um, what they did is the faculty divided into different committees for different areas of relief work. 
Um, and St. Mary's became a housing place for, um, for these 800 people um, that were displaced because they, they uh, lost their homes in the flood. Um, so you think about this, all of these people from the community are coming to UD to stay. Um, they're being provided with food, they're being taken care of, um, they're being treated for any sickness that they might have in, um, incurred from the flood. Um, and then the faculty are stepping aside from their regular roles to help, um, to help with this relief work and doing whatever they could do. Um, I think we've seen a lot of that. Why, again, I felt like this story was significant over the past year. Um, the same thing has happened at the University of Dayton as we've um, dealt with this pandemic and people have taken on many, many different job responsibilities that are not in their normal job description. Um, they've stepped into doing things like contact tracing um, and providing meals, uh, delivery, meal delivery in the um, student neighborhood. So there's a lot of things that have come up that um, people have responded to. And I think we see um, traces of that in, in our history and in our past with this flood and the way we responded to that. Um, this is something I thought was really particularly, um, it, it just, it, it moved me and it, it made me think of our community here today. Um, and this came from the, uh, the student newspaper talking about the flood. So in my research for this, I read through an old student newspaper that was talking about what was going on during this time. And I love this quote, there was an ever present air of cheerfulness and it was with feelings of regret that refugees bade farewell when they left for their homes in the city. Uh, so they came here, um, they were displaced from their home. So they're staying somewhere where they're not planning on staying. And I think if, if you've ever been displaced from your home for any reason, usually you're not really excited about being in whatever hotel room or a relative's house you're at. Um, I don't think usually what people say is, I'm really sad to leave my temporary housing. Um, they're usually really happy to get back home, right? Um, but that wasn't the case. People were made to feel welcome. Um, they were taken care of. Uh, and they were, um, yeah, they were, they were made to feel very much a part of this community. And this would become a significant turning point in our history because I think it was part of the influence for when the university changed its name from St. Mary's College to the University of Dayton to represent the broader connection to the Dayton community. So as a Catholic school, to have an identity that's rooted in our city um, says a lot about the connection that we have to the city um, and the priority that that takes. Um, so I wanted to share this story. I think my um, next, yes. So I will get to the next slide after our next wine tasting. But I, I feel like this flood is a really important time in our, in our history and um, the way that people stepped up and the way that we responded to a need that was around us in the surrounding area when we could have said, we're all safe and we're fine. So we're just gonna keep doing our own thing up on the hill. Um, that is not what happened. People reached out immediately to those in need um, and that has been a part of our mission and identity ever since. Um, all right, with that, I'm going to uh, stop share again and I will turn it back over to Bill for the next um, lovely rosé. Thank you, Allison. Okay, so now we're gonna take a journey down to Chile. So if you can see on the map here, uh, Chile is that thin long sliver that you'll see on the left. And there's a box that says the Chilean wine regions. And of course that is enhanced from the terms Elki, Limori, all the way down to Bio Bio Meleco. Um, so what's interesting about Chile is Chile is this long thin sliver of land. It's it's 3,000 miles long going from north to south, but it's no more than 220 miles at its widest point. Uh, and that's up in the north where the Atacama Desert is. And that's where the, um, the that you might remember a few years ago, they had the accidents with the coal miners. That's where that is. And that's the northernmost wine growing region. And that was actually one of the first areas to be planted. Um, what makes Chile unique is it's protected by four natural barriers. So in the north, you have the Atacama Desert. Uh, in the south, you have the Arctic. In the west, you have the Pacific. And in the east, you have the Andes. And when we're talking about winemaking, there's lots of different uh, things that can be a hindrance, uh, especially pests and little root louses. One of those root louses is phylloxera. And uh, Chile has never received phylloxera because it's protected by these four natural barriers. And this is a very easy way to remember being Christian. So I say Chile is protected by the four natural barriers. So it's the cross, right? So in the north, you have the Atacama Desert. Some parts of the Atacama Desert haven't seen rain for over 400 years. In the south, you have the Arctic, some of the coldest recorded temperatures ever known to man. In the west, you have the Pacific. And then again, in the east, you have the Andes. Why is that important? Because when you're talking about 
these little pests and root louses, they don't like extremities. So they can't come in from the north because the north is sand and it's a desert and they'll never survive. In the south, it's too cold. In the west, they don't know how to swim the backstroke so they can't survive. And of course, the, the Andes in the east, they'll never be able to survive the elevation and the temperature. So yes, Chile is blessed by four natural barriers. But what we're going to be focusing on this next wine is the area that you'll see there it says the Central Valley, or we like to say the Valley Central. And that encompasses Maipo, Cachapoal, Colchagua, Curaco, and Mao. So the next slide um, will show you, this is very important. So why is Chile, again, very unique? Because uh, where it sits, now, if we didn't have these four natural barriers, Chile would basically be a desert. Um, and so what happens is, and what's why it's great for wine growing is because you have these in the morning, you have these sea breezes coming in off the Pacific. So it's nice and cool. Then you get the heat, the, the intensity of the heat during the day. And then you get those sea, bree or sea breezes coming off of the Andes at nighttime. So it really protects it. If you didn't have those, you probably wouldn't be able to grow grapes there. So uh, it's very, very important. That's why we say the most important thing, it doesn't matter whether you're growing wine or anything else. What's the most important thing about having a business? Location, location, location. And this is, I think, one of the perfect areas. And they get over 300 days of sunshine and very little rain. So I'm very partial to uh, wines from South America, especially Chile. So the next wine is to go to the next slide, please. Uh, we're going to have the Natura Rosé. Uh, this is the 2020 vintage. And again, this comes from the Central Valley. Now, this actually consists of three different grape varieties that you would look at. And you're like, oh, the, of course, these are all red. So it consists of 40% Syrah, 40% Cabernet Sauvignon, and 20% Merlot. And what's really cool about Natura is, of course, when you look at the label and you see nature on it. Uh, actually, I remember visiting the vineyards back in 2015. And the, uh, the gentleman who was a good friend of mine, his name is Fernando Pavone, he actually took us out and we went on top of this hill. And he said, listen. And next time you go into a vineyard, I want you to listen, turn everything off. Do you hear? Do you hear mother nature? Do you hear the birds, the bees? It was like a symphony with all the birds, the bees that were communicating with each other. So this is actually Chile's first organic. And actually these vineyards are biodynamic. I, I don't want to get into that because that's a whole nother, you could talk about hours of that and I probably would put you to sleep. But organics are very, very important when you have, they took this vineyard over and it really was, it was dilapidated. It wasn't producing anything and they converted over to organic farming. And now they have all the wildlife. You have the birds, the bees, you have everything. They even have llamas, apacas and geese. They eat all the bad bugs and you know their feet, you know, cultivate the soils. So it's really, really cool what they're doing. Even on this bottle, the glass is made with recycled glass and the label is either made with recycled paper or seaweed. So this was actually Ch Chile's first 100% organic uh, rosé. Um, and uh, Emiliana is the producer and they are one of the best selling producers of organic wines in the world. Uh, they're actually the leading producer in all of Chile and now poss possibly all of the world. I had to double, double check on that again to see if those stats are correct. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, so this is uh, all hand harvested and this was in March, of course, of course, they are six months ahead of us and they actually age for three months uh, in stainless steel. So this is gonna be, again, very, very fresh. And let's give it a try here. By the way, I forgot to mention the Pinot Noir Rosé that we had, the residual sugar on that was 1.4 grams. The residual sugar on this is 8.6. So it's gonna jump up a little bit more. So let's see what we have here. Again, the color is beautiful, but a little bit lighter. And you would not think that being it, uh, it's Cabernet, uh, Syrah, and Merlot, because Pinot Noir is a very delicate skin, and, and, and Cabernet and Syrah and Merlot are intense. So very, very interesting. So in the nose, wow, you're getting um, like a cherry, some apple. One thing I love about this is the honeysuckle, um, some watermelon, some citrus fruits. And in the, in the taste, hmm. And you can tell that 8.6 residual sugar because if you, on the tip of your tongue, you get, that's where you get the fruitiness automatically. And I noticed there's a lot more fruit when I put it in my mouth than it was versus the rainstorm. Yeah, this is nice. There's some nice blackberries, some strawberries, raspberries. You're getting a little bit of currants and uh, almost like a creamy texture to it. Uh, it's very tart, crisp. And what I like about it is also the acidity. What do you, what is acidity? If you were to stick your tongue out, 
and get toothpicks and punch the side of your tongue, that's what acidity feels like. Um, Food-wise with this, yeah, I mean, this is, um, this is great with, again, fish, uh, some fried foods, uh, maybe some ni- you know, nice cheeses, of course, uh, maybe spicy food like Thai food, uh, Chinese, Szechuan, um, even sushi, ideal with some nice wasabi. But yeah, this is, uh, this is beautiful too as well. So we've had so far Syrah, Cabernet Merlot, and Pinot Noir. So, and there you go. And uh, Allison, I'll turn it back to you. Cheers. All right. I love it. We're getting- Hope you guys like this so far. Do we have thumbs up, everyone? (laughs) No. We can't see you, but- We can't see you, but I'm giving it a thumbs up because (laughs) it's- It's it's really fun. Let's get some Uh, comments. Come on, we love comments too, please. I don't see- I don't see any chats, do I? I don't, I don't think we get I them. think you guys are mastering the four ounce curls, you know, that's uh... <laughs> exercise and wine. That's right. Uh, there you go. Yeah. You get it all in one. And, yeah. And you get your, yeah, all the learning. It's, it's everything you need, mind, body, and spirit. <laughs> um, all right. I will go to this. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the admission of women at UD because that, that was not always a thing. Um, but I also want to share, so I got a, um, a note from another alumna who's watching this that, uh, she didn't know it was always called St. Mary's college, um, or that there was a time when it was called St. Mary's college. And, um, I wanted to say, I I don't think I mentioned this. It's, it's funny as you like kind of get to know the history, it becomes, it has become so ingrained in me because, um, I keep, I love talking about it. I love learning about it, but UD started as St. Mary's school for boys. And it was more of an elementary school really at that time. Um, that's, kind of just how things were like it was um it was a school where they taught uh german and um english and religion and some of those topics and then the um boys who were students at the school also had to work um on the farm uh so it, when we think about our education and both the practical nature of it and the um the liberal arts base um we have strong roots of that and it's one of the things i love best about Marianist education is that there's this, there's a firm commitment to both the theoretical and the humanities base of a good liberal arts education. And there's also an, an understanding of the need for practical skills. Um, and we still to this day talk about that. We talk about experiential learning. Um, we talk about hands-on type of experiences. We have a law school and a business school and engineering. Um, those are all practical professions. Um, and we have them because um, we value both together, both equally. So. I just want to say there, it was St. Mary's School for Boys. It later on became a college and was St. Mary's College. And then in 1920, it changed the name to the University of Dayton, which as is what we know it as today. Um, so 100 years later, we've had that name. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit about um, how do women come to be at UD. Um, and that was big news. One of the things that, I, um, that makes me proud of UD is that we were one of the earlier schools um, to admit women, um, which is which is great. That's and and I think and that pays off and that our history isn't that long. And the longer you've incorporated um, different groups of people, um, the more that becomes part of the fabric of the school and sort of the expectation. So um, a little bit about this. Uh, our first women students were admitted in 1920. So a big year for UD, changing the name and admitting women. Um, and if you read different history accounts, you might find that people say, well, it was 1935 that women were admitted. Well, that's also true. Um, they're both true. Uh, but 1920, the first women were admitted and they were just there to take night and weekend classes and no more than five a year. Um, and they were kept separate. Um, so Albert Emanuel Hall, which is now the Office of Admission, was the place where um, women were and they weren't like really allowed to go up on the hill any further. Um, so again, that geography kind of plays a role. That hill has, has become significant. Um, so it was 15 years before the women were admitted full-time, but they, they were allowed to start taking classes in 1920. Um, as I mentioned, UD led Catholic schools in admitting women. Um, and I would love to say their rationale for this was all about inclusion and that they were that forward thinking. That is probably part of it, um, but it was actually a really shrewd financial move. It, um, there was sagging enrollment during the Great Depression, and this was a way that UD could get more students. Um, so sometimes, oftentimes the right move to make financially is also the right move to make from justice perspective. So um, they made this decision and it was helpful. Um, It became helpful all the way down the line. Um, So in 1935, the Sisters of Notre Dame um, wanted to open a college for women. Um, So they didn't want to do this without like sort of testing it out. So what happened is UD said, okay, 
why don't you use our facilities for two years um, and we'll see how it goes. Um, essentially, that was kind of the idea. And so, like I mentioned, women were segregated from the rest of the school. All the classes were in the, oh, it was the library at the time, Albert Emanuel Library. So that building has changed its function throughout the years as well. Um, and you will find that with a lot of buildings at UD. In fact, if you talk to, uh, depending on um, what class years your alumni are, <clears throat> you may remember the buildings having different functions. Um, so the women were segregated in Albert Emanuel. And then again, that's something I think about when I walk by it all the time. Um, but that's really kind of the central part of campus now, but it was very it considered very separate. Um, and it was called the College of Women at the University of Dayton. So another name change here. Um, and this is something, <laughs> extra hurdle that they had to jump through. They had to prove local residency with a parent or guardian to be admitted. There was no women's housing. So they had to, they had to prove that they lived somewhere nearby um, and that they had a parent or guardian in order to attend school here. Um, so they weren't just allowed to enroll like they are now. Um, after 1937, the College of Women portion of the name was dropped. Um, so it, it really, it didn't take very long. So 1920, we have the first women. 1935, um, they're admitted sort of full-time. 1937, the College of Women portion was dropped. Um, so we got rid of that in two years. And then in the 1938 Daytonian, um, we say perhaps it won't be assuming too much to say that we have passed the point of being tolerated and now actually receive a welcoming smile from the masculine student body. Um, I love finding these quotes and like some of these um, original sources about um, what the experience was like because if you hear it talked about today, it, it might sound like, all oh, right, we admitted women and everyone was really happy about that. Maybe not the case at first, um, but it didn't take very long to make the shift. And I think that that's uh, also says something about the university and the culture that in the scope of really 15 years, um, and you can even say three, if you wanna look at when women, women were admitted full time to when the name was dropped and everything, to, to have that transition and the attitude um, is pretty significant. The other thing is this isn't very many years later that World War II started. And at that time, women compromised more than, um, or comprised more than half of the enrollment at UD. Um, now, I think with our current enrolling class, with the class for next year, there are more men than women by just a little bit, um, but that number has been very close um, for a lot of our history. So the in, in pretty close to 50-50. Um, so when we think about this, um, it, we went from, and women being segregated to women being an equal part of the student body um, and really what is a pretty short time. Um, and this is, so these are the takeaways I kind of wanted to leave you with. You might be wondering, well, why did we learn about the flood? Why did we learn about the founding? And why um, uh, are we learning about the admission of women? And why did I pick these three stories? Um, one of the things I wanted to kind of emphasize is that our history is short. It's only 171 years um, that we've been a school. And in that time, it was, uh, a grade school for 14 boys to the booming um, university with graduate programs and research programs that it is today. Um, that's not really that much time when you think about how many generations that is. Um, thinking about when you graduated and how many people before you might have um, some, you know, some people's great greats um, might have been some of the early students at UD. So um, it's a really, really short time, but we're still, and we're still heavily influenced by some of those early decisions our founders made. Um, we still have some of the same buildings, uh, a lot of the same buildings. So um, despite the history with fires in St. Joe's, um, that we still have a lot of the same buildings at UD. Um, UD has always had a role in the Dayton community. That's again, why I picked the flood story. I think it's important to like highlight that connection. Um, and this is another one and something that uh, again, when I look at the Marianists and their charism and what's unique about being a Marianist university, UD is quick to adapt to changing times in society. So reading what's going on in the environment around us and saying, what are we as a university going to do about it? Um, that's, that's a really import, important part of who we are. And when the pandemic hit as an employee, I was like, I think we're going to make it because we have a history of making it through these things and figuring out how to respond and what needs to change and how we can continue to adapt to that um, going forward. Um, and not being so mired in the old ways of doing things that we lose sight of what's needed for in, in our current society. Um, so those are the reasons I picked those stories. Of course, there are many, many more and I could go on, but really there's more wine to drink. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Bill for the final wine of the evening.
so many stories and the more wine you have the more stories you have <laughs> absolutely for sure um okay so our final wine is uh we're going to go to italy uh because that's my little bit of my heritage and uh how do you talk about four thousand years of wine making and like you know speed tasting uh time you can't it's impossible but italy is basically one of the largest producing wine countries in the world it has over 20 different regions, like the United States has 50 states, um, but it's the largest wine producing country in the world. It's smaller than the size of California. So that's pretty amazing. But the last wine we're having comes from an area called the Veneto. The Veneto is the leading producer of wine in all of Italy. So they rank out of all 20 regions, they are ranked number one. You might know the Veneto because of two famous cities, well, there's actually many, but the one is Venice, which you see uh, on the map there. And of course, if you go directly to the left, you'll see Verona. Verona is a city of Romeo and Juliet. The wine that we're going to be focusing on today comes from the area of Treviso, which is directly north of Venice. It's actually been one of my favorite areas. And uh, you might know this area because directly above it is Colignano. This is the famous area for where Prosecco is produced. So uh, yeah, Prosecco is produced in this area. So I'm sure you've had all Prosecco before, but this is Treviso is where it comes from. On the next slide, you'll see that, um, you know, there's many different um, types of sparkling wines in Italy. We have Spumante, we have Frizzante, we have Vavace. So Spumante is fully sparkling. Uh, and that's what we're going to be having here now. Frizzante is lightly sparkling. So that's kind of like, say, maybe San Pellegrino water. And then Vavace is a slight touch of frizziness. Um, that would be like a wine such as something like Rianiti Lambrusco, for example. Um, and believe it or not, Italy, when you when you put all these three categories together, Italy is the largest producer of sparkling wines in the world. And that's with the categories of Spumante, Frizzante, and Vivace. There's two types of sparkling wines. They call it Method Charmats or Charmat process or Methodo Classico or Methodo Traditionale Classico, which is uh, that last one is basically how they make it in Champagne where the fermentation is done in the bottle. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, fermentation is done in the bottle where the Charmat process is in a closed container. So big, big vat. Uh, so what we're having here today is not, the fermentation is not in the bottle, it's all done in a big tank. On the next slide, um, we'll show you the areas. This is basically the areas, oh, you got it. This is, nope, go back, there you go. Uh, this is where these vines grow and they grow on these hills. And pretty much a lot of this stuff is all hand harvested. But if you ever get the opportunity, I know everybody, when they go to the Veneto, they want to go to either Venice or they want to go to Verona, but try and spend a day and go up north or two days because it's absolutely breathtaking. It's spectacular. The food is amazing. The wines are even better. So if you do get a chance, you know, you can also email me if you want some suggestions. My email address is whitingwine at gmail.com. So W-H-I-T-I-N-G-W-I-N-E at gmail.com. All right, let's go to the next slide, which is this last one we're having. And of course, it's a sparkling wine. So just be careful because you see this thing up here, this is a deadly weapon because this is under pressure. You know, this thing can go skyrocket in the air. So some people you might see when like a baseball team wins a World Series or somebody wins a car race and they get this and they pop it out. No, don't do that. And if anyone's going to do that, go far away as possible uh, from them because this is dangerous. So uh, removing this is pretty simple, but I always like to have something, uh, 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 maybe a towel or, you know, use your strong hand to open it. And the one thing you have to remember when you're opening a sparkling wine is on the top, you hold still, you always twist from the bottom like that. And then I love this sound that you're about to hear. It. Where's the microphone? Oh, yeah. <laughs> So this is our Maschio Rosé. So Maschio is a producer of sparkling wines and regular wines, but uh, mostly sparkling. They actually got their start back uh, over 100 years ago, and um, they actually produced something called Grappa. Grappa is the spirit of Italy. It's basically the distillant of the leftovers of the skins and the seeds. And it's like I, we call the Italian's version of white lighting. It's pretty nasty. You have to have a palate for it, but it's not for me. 
But um, so they actually then started making wine. And this is a rosé. So this is a blend of, now it's a non-vintage. It's a blend of three varieties, Pinot Bianco or Pinot Blanc, Pinot Noir, and Roboso. So the Roboso, we like to say, gives it the color because, again, Pinot Blanc and Pinot Noir are a little bit lighter skin. I, I do have an interesting thing. I know we're going to run out of time, but you've had a grape variety and you've had a wine called Pinot Grigio before. Is Pinot Grigio a white or a red grape variety? Hmm. It's a red grape variety. It's actually a mutation of Pinot Noir. What happened is the Pinot Grigio or the Pinot Gris or Pinot Noir, excuse me, Pinot Noir came over from France and it came to Italy and it mutated and it changed this battleship gray color. And so the Italians said, oh, it's the gray Pinot. So what is the term for gray in Italian? Grigio. So it was known as Pinot Grigio, the gray Pinot. So Pinot Grigio is really a red grape variety. So uh, the Robusta will give it the color, the Pinot Bianco and the Pinot Blanc. Basically, uh, they're a ge generic mutation of Pinot Noir. Um, but I think I love the, the sparkle, the color. You're going to love everything about this. Now, this has the most residual sugar. This has about 14.6 grams per liter of residual sugar. So in the nose, again, very florally. Nice white peach, almost like a cotton candy character. Hmm. Strawberries, cherries, very fruit forward. Now, this is great. Like I said, you can have this with something really, really spicy. Uh, great with hors d'oeuvres. Um, and even with dessert, you can have it with something, say, like uh, white meats. Uh, you could have, it, like I said, chicken wings. You could have it with uh, Milano's uh, ham grinder. Um, you can have it with maybe a tort. Uh, any fruit, you no, know, maybe even just like a fruit. Actually, if you get some fresh fruit, you chop it up and you pour a little bit of this in it. I mean, why not? But I think this is always a great way to uh, to end a day is with some bubbles. So, um, and I know before I turn it back to you, Alison, I want to thank you personally. I also want to thank Mackenzie. Uh, I also want to thank Vin Porter because they were the ones, if you bought the wines from them, uh, Jared, he uh, kind of hooked us up. So I want to thank them and I want to thank all of you. And uh, I wish you all a very happy Memorial Day weekend and go Flyers. Cheers. Cheers. What a great way to kick it off, right? So, um, <laughs> Can't beat, you can't beat that. Um, so what we are going to do is we are taking Q&A right now. Um, so if you have any questions for me or Bill, any, any questions at all, um, feel free to ask them. Please submit them through the Q&A and we'll get them. Um, I'll go through them as we can. Um, You're thirsty. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Keep drinking and asking questions. Type them in the chat if you have comments you want to type it. Uh, sorry, the chat's disabled. If you want to type them into the Q&A, we'll get those as well. So. Um, feel free to do that. We've gotten some um, comments from some of you all who are watching, which is fabulous. Um, so I want to start, we have the first question that came in a little earlier and it is, and I don't have a, a great answer, but I'm going to find it out. Um, and I know who came from, so I can get back with you. But do we know if any of the houses in the neighborhood were damaged in the flood? It is a great question. I actually, um, I don't know for sure the answer to that question. What I can say is I know a bunch of them a bunch of the houses in the neighborhood were built after the flood, um, post-1920. Um, so those obviously wouldn't have been. Um, but I will um, actually look that up and find out because it's just a great piece of trivia to know anyway. Um, so I'll get back to you um, more on that one. Um, but I don't I don't know at the, at the moment for now. I, like I said, I do know a lot of the houses are a little bit newer than the flood. Um, so that would rule out most of them, but um, there may be a few that existed back at that time that were damaged. Um, all right, this one's for Bill. What is your favorite rosé? There's a, I have a few questions for you, so I'll start with that one. What's your favorite rosé? I'm like saying which is my favorite ch child, but I don't have I know, I, was, I thought that was um, going to no, be answered. <laughs> um, you know, it depends. It, you know, you know I kind of go, but I love Rosé is from Provence, uh, but that's the whole thing about rosé. It's such it's a such an incredible and versatile wine that you know there's a rosé for everything for for sweet for dry um, different varieties. But uh, you know I get you know honestly I have to say that Rainstorm really impressed me, and I'm not saying it because I know the people that own it, but um, for a rosé that can last that long. You know, because you have to remember, wine does not like air, light, heat, or vibration. And most of the time when you have a young wine like that, if you have it in any of those elements, it'll just deteriorate rapidly. This one has not. And I'm really, really, really impressed. That, uh, but I do. I mean, I've had some incredible rosés from 
great varieties that I never even thought uh, would could they made rosés. You know, that's a beautiful thing about even Italy. You know, there's so there's thousands of great varieties in Italy just alone. I mean, then you go to Spain, then you go to France, and you go to Croatia, you go to Hungary, and they all make their rosés. So, I guess uh, I mean for now, I like that. I'm going to be drinking that rainstorm tonight for sure. That's my favorite right now. Absolutely. Wonderful. Great answer. Um, next question is also for you. Is it bad to put ice in your rosé? Drink whatever you want. Do whatever you want. There's no rules. You're not going to prison or jail if you want to put ice in it. No, if you, you can do whatever you want. More power to you. If you want to have this rosé with your filet mignon or your, uh, your Ben & Jerry's, I don't care. If you like it, that's the most important thing. Um, that would, again, another great answer, giving people permission <laughs> to enjoy their wine. Yeah, so um, it's, it's your palate, not mine. It's yeah. You do what, that you want to enjoy it. You know? And also don't be judgy. Um, exactly. Are, why is it that the Maschio has the highest residual sugar, but tastes less sweet than the Natura? Really? That's what, uh, uh, that, that is a question. <laughs> I probably drank too much. I think it's probably because the bubbles, the effervescence takes away some of that sweetness makes sense that usually that usually can do it absolutely if this was a still wine now if you huh, i won't be able to finish all this tonight uh, and the other one and the other one um but if i were to let this sit and go flat i guarantee you you would taste more of the sweetness of it without that effervescence for sure perfect thank you um all right now this and if you have if you have thoughts on this bill, I welcome them. But um, if it's it was directed at me, if the Marinus were a variety of wine, which would they be and why? <laughs> um, so I might say, what's one that can survive a lot of changes? I mean, I feel like um, the the first one that you talked about might be it if it can survive all of those things. But that's only a few years old. So they're like a okay. grand crew. They're the premier. They're the crop. They're the best. Oh, that <laughs> all right. That's it. So there you go. Um, that's a collaborative answer. Um, all right, and then let's see. Do I happen to know if the Dayton Dayton um, was active in the suffragette movement because they admitted women just after the right to vote? Um, boy, that is another great question. Uh, I I have not. I feel like this is something I would know if they were um, because it's something that usually the stories we're really proud of that have kind of withstood the test of time. We kind of hear about. Um, I can dig into that more. I have heard nothing to say that they they were very active in the suffragette move, movement. Um, and like I said, the admission of women wasn't entirely a justice move, uh, if at all a justice move. It was to um, decrease or to increase enrollment. So my instinct, my first guess is probably not um, or not very active at any rate. Um, however, um, I will I will try to find that out as well um, and see if there's any evidence of it. Um, so what I would say is for now, no. Um, and if I can find out any of it's contrary, I will definitely let you know. Um, and I think, let's see, that is everything. Okay. So yes, we are right about at our time. Um, and that is the last question that came in. Um, uh, the UD Alumni Association will send a follow-up email to all of you. Um, and this recording will be available, like we mentioned. Um, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to be here tonight. I really want to thank Bill who makes this like so much fun to do. And I learned so much from you every time um, and feel just very empowered to pick out wine and enjoy it. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and I just, like I said, thank you all for being here, for taking the time to be part of this. Um, it means a lot uh, to all of us. And um, I hope we can do more programming like this in the future uh, because it sure is a lot of fun. So thank you all and have a wonderful evening and a great rest of your Memorial Day. And Bill is saying cheers to you all with a great glass of wine.